Hello, everyone. We are very happy to start our panel within the ACTM project on decolonization. Our panel called Who Are We Through Our Music? Shifting Identities on the Journey from the Soviet Empire to Independent Nations. Uh, we are going to uh, present four different papers for your consideration. And we would like to thank the ICTM for this uh, very stimulating event and the organizers uh, for uh, uh, taking, you know, responsibility to run it. So please, Carlos, start the video. Hello, dear colleagues and friends. I will start by providing some background ideas and the theoretical basis for our four presentations. It is well known, truism or cliche, that history needs to be recorded. As scholars, we know, however, that it takes a long time for these recordings to appear and be appropriately summarized and conveyed for the understanding of future generations. It takes many scholars and much institutional capacities to do justice to the study of some specific phenomenon, such as decolonization, which happened and continues to happen in the wake of fallen empires. So the collapse of the USSR in 1991 was the greatest geopolitical disaster in the history of Euro-Asia. It brought up a major economic, political, social and cultural challenges resulting with the disintegration of the state into 15 sovereign republics of the former Soviet Empire. The economic impact followed following the collapse of the Soviet Union led to a severe economic crisis and a notable decline in the living standards of all post-Soviet states. Today, scholars consider the dissolution of the USSR to have had a greater impact for, by some measures than the Great Depression. For instance, according to Stephen Rosefield, 3.5 million premature deaths in Russia from 1990s to 1998 came as a direct result of the neoliberal shock therapy from the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, all four of our presenters on the panel today were brought up in the USSR. From childhood memories of living under socialism, we were all in different ways caught up by the crush of the Soviet Union in the middle of our lives and careers. Some of us still live and work in the former Soviet Union, others have moved away. I am reminded of a quote by the great German poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, 1748-1832, who once said, The world split and a rift has gone through my heart. Goethe, 1774. Our feelings in facing such a disaster were the same. We all experienced a deep shock with sudden schism and gap in our lives. Therefore, for the ICTM Music and Dance Decolonization Project of Studies, in many sense, we relate as the most recent victims and witnesses of the particular phenomenon called decolonization. So far, the cultural approach to the Soviet and post-Soviet times still remains an undefined area for much of the scholarly understanding. 
Music offers a mirror into the Soviet and post-Soviet social lives, life and the collective cognitive experience. Looking at it over the post-Soviet time will allow us to determine the notable cultural changes that have taken place. Music is a me mirror of history. Music carries a rich spectrum of cultural information reflecting on the current social situation. To better understand the specific situated context of decolonization, let's raise the mirror and focus our attention on the music and identity in our area of the post-Soviet time. Thanks for inviting us to participate in the research area, which is a necessary challenge for all of us. Although our experience is a recent one, we are happy to share our observations on the study of various music genres covering different areas and regions with new data and documentation. I'm honored to team with Kaneke, Lera, Zilla in sharing thoughts on the decolonization processes in the music study of the post-Soviet era within Russia, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. I'm going to focus on music performed by Central Asian migrant labor communities in Russia. The large migrant labor workforce forks, force coming from Central Asia and the Caucasus to Russia brought new sounds and new images of Muslim culture. Investigating the influence of the new migrant labor on music, my aim is to question the entertaining style of contemporary music scene in Russian cities, in particular in Moscow. Where is home for the labor workers' people? Migration is currently a prominent global issue with recent political trends bringing it to the fore of numerous domestic political agendas worldwide. According to authoritative sources, in 2020 there were estimated 272 million immigrants in the world. World history of mankind presents to our attention numerous examples of mass migration of people, especially after the fall of empires. A similar process is taking place today in the territory of the former USSR. Labor migrants from the republics of the former Soviet Union travel great distances by 2,000 miles on buses to reach remote Russian cities in search of new job. How do these migrant communities survive? Here is the map of the former USSR, as you can see, a massive country. And here is the Central Asia from where the uh, largest uh, work uh, uh, migrants communities are coming to uh, work in Russia. Central Asian migrants in Moscow can be seen from the first minutes of arrival at the airport, from the inside of cars, from hotel windows, as taxi drivers, sales assistant, builders in banks and other official organizations as cleaners, and on the streets as janitors. Such a visible public presence shows that the phenomenon has been allowed on different levels and established by the present government through discussions and agreements to accept certain policies and rules. The following statistic helps to explain the proportion of Muslim versus Russian Moscovites. Of the 95 nationalities living in Moscow, 47 ethnic groups are Muslim. Although these figures are from the year 2010 and only officially registered, uh, migrants were included, it shows a general increasing trend of Muslim ethnic and religious correlation. 
Here is a textbook image of Moscow, which we used to see in our uh, school books. Here is the Moscow today. You can see the images of today. As Al Jazeera mentioned, uh, in 2015, despite animosity, Moscow's Muslim change, the city, at least 1.5 million Muslims in Russia's capital, form fastest growing and most ethnically diverse demographic group. The Express Tribune by July 22, 2015 is following saying, Moscow becoming Europe's largest Muslim city. Here is the main um, mosque, Moscow central uh, uh, mosque, which is uh, was recently built, and uh, it's very as we, you can see large and beautiful. The Moscow Cathedral Mosque is the largest and tallest mosque in Russia and in Europe. Its size is more than 19,000 square meters, which enables it to hold at least 10,000 worshippers at once. So, the popular group in Moscow today, if we are talking about music, that regularly appears on television and corporate shows is a Russian Uzbek ethnofolk band with the paradoxical name Obmarek Imama, a name that ambiguously sounds like fainting imam. The group consists of leader singer Ikhtiar Kadyrov, Doira and Fremdram, Jurabek Abdullaev, the Uzbek plat Lutar and Alexei Barakov, accordion, which is particularly popular in the Khorezm area of Western Uzbekistan. The band, formed with labor migrants in 2004, became famous within a few weeks, performing in Moscow, St. Petersburg and other nearby cities with their instant heat. I try to read it. I cannot remember when I moved to this land. I must have been drunk, I might have been drunk, when a cop stops me saying, you don't have a work permit, I answer with, hang on, my address today is. This song mocks the Soviet white heat, my address is the Soviet Union, my address Sovetsky Soyuz, which is used to be a rock anthem symbolizing the friendship of all Soviet people in the 1970s, 1980s. This song was satirically re-recorded in 2002 by Sergei Shnurov, the leader of the Leningrad group. In 2004, the song was performed by the group Obmarek Imama, making it instant heat again by representing her feelings of the humiliated diaspora. In addition to comical songs that tease the memorable ethno-national efforts of the Soviet Union, the group is famous also for the remakes of Katyusha and other Russian pop and rock songs. The reaction of listeners to the comical remakes of Russian folk songs performed in an Uzbek style is so widely perceived as delighted that the group now performs everywhere, including at anniversaries and wedding celebrations, with a distinctive style that includes wearing Uzbek national costumes, playing traditional Uzbek instruments, singing in Russian with a strong Uzbek accent and using traditional Uzbek microtones with rich melismatic voice embellishments, the performers have gained wide recognition amongst listeners. Here you can see the group with three musical instruments and a singer in the middle. And now we are going to listen to them. Up 
грехов не помню. Наверное, я был ябухой. Мой адрес не дом и не улица. Мой адрес сегодня такой. Мой адрес не дом и не улица. Мой адрес сегодня такой. Бывали Ленинград и Сколтовка. A show that has been popular in Moscow is a chanted theatrical narrative called the Akin Opera, composed by Pamir Tajik migrants Pakiza Kurbanasenova, Ajam Chukubayev, and Abdulmamad Bekmamadev, who performs using voice a long necked lutar and frame drum doira, respectively. During the week, the actors are busy working. One is a cleaner in the tax administration office, another an assistant painter, and the last, a bank teller, but on the weekends. They are engaged with music and the arts. Through the medium of music and song, Akin Opera tells of their lives in Moscow. The show takes place on the stage of the new theatre docks. Central Asian Janitor Scoop Major Russian Theatre Award screamed the headlines when the Akin Opera actors received a special award at Russia's most prestigious theatre festival, the Golden Mask, held at the Moscow's Bolshoi Theatre. Most of the performance in theatre dogs are staged in the genre of documentary theatre based on authentic text, interviews, and the face face fates of real people, very often migrant workers. Here we can see the group of Akin Opera performers. They are enjoying themselves on the stage uh, during the performance. And you can see that they are also uh, just uh, recently issued some CDs with a um, CD album called Two Sisters with the same musical instruments accompanying on the same instruments and singing Tajik, uh, Pamir Tajik songs. So Abdul Mamad Bek Mamadov is a winner of a special award in the most prestigious theatre festival in 2014 in Moscow, The Golden Mask. And certainly that happened thanks to uh, the help of Sevalet Lisovsky, who is the Theatre Dogs director, script writer and commissioner. <laughs> Smartphones culture. Today Moscow is a city of free Wi-Fi, which is available on the streets and parks and metro trains, buses and pedestrian zones. No wonder the migrant smartphone have proven to be the best tools for the cultural adjustments of labor workers. 
the new technological advances helping migrants to balance their old and new identity have facilitated the use of smartphones not only as a communication device, but also as a means of development of the new music genres, bands and video clips, filmed, for example, on Samsung Galaxy S7. Therefore, smartphones deeply affect the Russian migrant community's culture. Some examples I wanted to show you. Jumali Arunbaev, a migrant from Kyrgyzstan, who dedicates the song to his homeland. So, as you notice, the song was full of homesick feelings and regret that he is not at home. The song was performed in Kyrgyz and Russian languages in alternation. Irina Smele is another performer. She sings in Tatar language to prove her national identity. And she makes her recordings, uh, her songs recordings on her smartphone. You see, Samsung Gal Galaxy S7 uh, under the name Tatarka. She is another example of growing rap culture among migrant communities in Russia. So she performs in Tatar and it's about the uh, beauty of Tatar girls. So, conclusion, trying to explore the sense of national identity as a social category for those migrants finding themselves both within the and outside Central Asian communities, we found that the present Moscow soundscape has changed. Taking the understanding of national identity in music as, I quote, the relationship between musical practice and the symbolization of construction of identity, we looked at several different music-making styles performed by migrant communities in Moscow, 
what we found is that the with political and official narratives celebrating the plurality of culture and religion in the city, Moscow melange of musical sounds shifted to reflect, to reflect this. Thank you for your attention. Greetings, dear colleagues. I'm happy to be here today on ICTM Dialogues. And first of all, I want to pay my gratitude to all who organized this uh, meeting and to all of you who came to take part uh, in it. And today I'm going to discuss um, the methods for studying traditional music in post-Soviet Kazakhstan. The fall of the Soviet Union showed the weakness of its political system. Total control over the economy, society, and people's spiritual life led to the collapse of the Communist Party's power. It seemed then that the restriction of freedoms was associated with Soviet realities. Not only was freedom expected from the new post-Soviet life, but also related discoveries in science, including music culture. The past 30 years led to questions was the situation with the study of musical traditions in the USSR so bad? And did Kazakh musicology manage to solve the problems during the years of independence? Throughout its history, Kazakh music has been transformed and developed under internal growth and intercultural interaction factors. Over the past hundred years, Many traditions have been endangered under the influence of ideology or globalization factors. Nevertheless, dozens of schools and regional traditions are still living, preserving ar archaic artifacts and, at the same time, seeking modern forms of expression. Old songs and cues are performed on modernized instruments along with solo ensemble and orchestral music making. In addition, musicians actively use modern uh, technical means, microphones and amplifiers. Kazakh ethnomusicology found itself in the face of several pressing problems. First, it's necessary to assess the consequences of ideological and globalization interference in traditional communities' lives and its impact on the functioning of world traditions today. Second, it's no less important to conduct a large-scale audit of the study of Kazakh traditions by Western and local researchers to summarize all scientific achievements. Finally, besides new forms of traditional music, various types of stage folklorism need to be studied as well. The intense musical life of the Kazakh people especially over the last century, has been studied by outsiders and insiders, musicologists and ethnographers. The path of uh, Kazakh ethnomusicology and its current state uh, reflects the development of methods for studying traditional music. Often research innovation anticipated radical transformations in the country's life and actively influence the shift in the paradigm of thinking. The mutual uh, influence of ethnomusicology and public life can be traced throughout the history of Kazakhstani science. The studies on traditional Kazakh music were established within the Russian ethnography and folkloristics more than 200 years ago. In this sense, Kazakh ethnomusicology is as old as many others. German, Scandinavian, Polish, Russian, for example. Applying the methods of Western musical ethnography, uh, mainly field and archival work, such researchers as Rybakov, Bimboes, Eichhorn, Zatayevich, Yerzakovich, um, Aravin, and others created impressive collections of songs, cues, and musical instruments. The work of Alexander Zatayevich is remarkable, concerning the influence of musicology on the cultural paradigm. At the beginning of his almost accidental acquaintance with Kazakh music in 1920, 
he viewed it from a Eurocentric positions as a material for preservation and use in composing work. But rather quickly, he revised his views, realized the intrinsic value of the phenomenon he was studying, and attempted to generalize the features of Kazakh music thinking based on comparative observations. Zatayevich's attitude to ethnic traditions on, uh, and his active propaganda work um, drew attention to the Kazakh music of many Western musicians. They motivated musicians to master forms of concert performance understandable to Europeans. As a result, Kazakh music began to be perceived as part of the family of Soviet traditions. Throughout the works of Viktor Belaev, Kazakh music was also included in early Soviet comparative musicology. In the 1950s and 60s, he and other researchers studied Kazakh music from the historical and comparative topological perspectives, derived a system of genres based on the functions and content of traditional songs and cues, and studied the interaction of Kazakh and Russian cultures. The great merit of Ozatayevich and Belayev was the breadth of their views in studying Kazakh traditions as self-valuable phenomena. However, Eurocentric positions remained in ethnomusicology until the 1990s. Till the 1920s, ethnically Kazakh musicians were alienated from Kazakh music studies. Thus, throughout practically all Soviet decades, research within the framework of Western science uh, had the official status. Prominent scholars, ethnic Kazakhs of the period were Ahmed Jubanov, Kafura Bisenova, Asiya Baigaski, Nazim Lakospagov, Almaty Mirbekova, and others. Since then, they implemented the methods of Western folklore and comparative studies common in the Soviet Union. For example, the genre system of the Kazakh song was classified along the lines of the Russian one. Boris Yerzakovich singled out family and household, family and ritual songs, labor, lyric songs, songs of social protest, historical and epic songs. Currently, this classification according to the functional thematic principle is used along with the new approach developed by Saida Ilimanova, based on function, type of tradition and invariant, ritual, everyday, professional songs, lyrical and epic with ritual or akin melodic complex. Oral traditions have developed their own system for preserving and transmitting both the principles of musical thinking and the terminology associated with them, as well as the names of great musicians. Only in the mid-1980s did the musicologists begin to study this autochthonal system of knowledge applied by such researchers as Bakhtaule Tamanov, Alma Kunatbaeva, Asiya Mohambetova, Saida Yelimanova, Bazaral Muptikeev, and others. Kunatbaeva called it the third science. During the Soviet period, there always was a share of dissatisfaction in some aspects and approaches to Kazakh traditional music, in the sense of value. <clears throat> Kazakh musicians insisted on the equality of Western composers and traditional masters. So more, Ahmed Jubanov called the authors of the Kazakh songs and cues folk composers a great value in recognizing the equivalent of Western written and oral tra Kazakh traditions have the works by Asiya Mohambetova and Saida Ilamanova, published in uh, the 1980s. In the sense of theoretical discourse, it became clear that the notions and categories of Western music theory are hardly applicable to many categories of traditional composition. Numerous attempts to analyze Kazakh cues, 
undertaken by Pyotr Aravin, Baldurgan Baikadama, Babakir Bayakhunov, and other researchers from the standpoint of Western music theory, made it possible to reveal the similarity of such compositional principles of European and Kazakh music as thematic deployment, variation, motive development, canons, and counterpoints. Their research influenced the transfer of the QE compositional principles to the work of Western model composers. However, this approach did not allow explaining the originality of the QE. Research by Bagdaulet Amanov uh, in 1970s and 80s and his followers from Reimbergen of Shigibayev, uh, Utgaliyeva, led uh, to the introduction of authentic Kazakh terminology in the scholar discourse, which has identified the peculiarities of the Kazakh instrumental composition. Since the late Soviet period, 1970s and later, a kind of academic protest movement separated two lines of Kazakh traditional music studies, the mainstream and the new school, developed under strong influences of so-called Glgitmik, Leningrad State Institute of Theater, Music and Cinema, now Russian Institute of Art History. Especially Professor Zim Izali Zimtsovsky and Igor Matsevsky. The last one turned towards appraising uh, ethnomusicology and its methods, uh, including the context studies, tradition bearers, the schools, uh, discourse, etc. Significant researchers by Amanov, Kunanbaeva, Yelimanova, Muhampetova, Amarova, Utikaliva, and their followers changed the landscape of Kazakh ethnomusicology. They were based on the system ethnophonic method proposed by Matsievsky and the interdisciplinary approach by Zimsovsky, combining the principles of Western ethnomusicology and Soviet musicology. Another factor of changes in international, is international events and contacts in the late Soviet and post-Soviet times. Starting from the third musical tribune of the Asian countries in 1973 in Almaty, such con concepts as oral professionalism, musical cultural traditions, the viability of music genres, ethnomusicology, appear. The newest developments in the methods of local ethnomusicology were influenced by ICTM and Russian Musical East Studies, the newly developed field. Joint meetings of researchers and festivals of traditional music led to the realization of the common musical traditions of the Turkic-speaking peoples. Thus, the concept of music of the Turkic-speaking world was established within the framework of the ICTM conferences. At the root of the study group uh, were Western and Turkish scholars, especially Janos Sibos, uh, Dorit Klebe, Professor Hiromel Lorraine Sakata, Teza Tansuk, Hande Saglam, and researchers from the post-Soviet countries, Razia Sultanova, Fatah Alexadeh, Saida Yelimanova, Sauli Utigaliva. Complex studies of music culture as a system of traditions of different genesis, ethnic and westernized, established through the context with Russian post-Soviet scholar community of musical East studies, first of all, Violeta Yunusova. During the Soviet era, the studies of such traditions as Baksalek, Shaman, Thikar, Aitis, Poet Singers Competition, Dom Brashert Pekui, East Kazakhstan Q tradition, were either forbidden due to ideological reasons or considered futile. Only in the last three decades, such Kazakhstani scholars as Saida Yelimanova, Bazarali Muktikiv, Jebek Kozakhmetova, Sauli Utigaliva, and others initiate studies of these traditions. One of the signs of the period was the study of the Kazakh diaspora's music. Thanks to the Kazakhs of Mongolia, such traditions as the Karajorga dance 
and the performance of Sibesge reed flute cues were revived. In China, among the Kazakh diaspora, the original forms of Vaitis, the Dampra tradition of the Jitisu region, have been preserved. Although uh, researchers uh, such as Bazarali Muptikev, Talgat Mukishev, uh, Saida Daukeva, Jennifer Post, and others have collected and analyzed extensive field material, there is still a linguistic barrier between researchers from Kazakhstan and China. Nowadays, Kazakh ethnomusicology takes the best from the Soviet past, existing post-Soviet scholar connections, and Western ethnomusicology. The urgent tasks now are implementing musical anthropological method in the study of traditional Kazakh music actively developing in the West, the study of intercultural interaction in the globalization and post-globalization era. As you probably noticed, among the mentioned achievements of Kazakhstani musicology, I practically did not name the preservation of the intangible cultural heritage. The first steps in this direction have already been taken. The art of Q has been included in the UNESCO representative list. However, over the 30 post-Soviet years, little has been done to compile a national list of intangible cultural heritage, community bearers and prominent representatives of traditions. So, there is a necessity to build a dialogue between the authorities of independent Kazakhstan, scholars and creative communities to ensure the solid and natural development of all Kazakh music and finally decolonize social consciousness in its attitude to cultural values. I appreciate your attention and looking forward to questions. Hello everyone, greetings from Canada. I'm very glad to participate in ICTM Dialogues and would like to thank this opportunity to share my recent research. Thank you. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, newly emerged Central Asian countries are in search of their own identity and national ideology. Even though the situation in each country is different, there are some similar problems. In the case of Kyrgyzstan, for example, the situation in the cultural sphere has changed dramatically over the past three decades. The new Kyrgyz government does not fully subsidize the cultural sector and much of the cultural budget has been cut. The conservatory, opera and ballet theater and other arts institutions originally created by the Soviets are now declining. Many music professionals have left the country and there is no much interest among young musicians in a music career. Moreover, the material base for music education has not been updated. So in many cases, there is only what remains from the Soviet era. It is a struggle, but at the same time, a new opportunity has opened up for musicians to express their identity without any barriers. In this presentation, I will share my research on ethno jazz in Central Asia to show how musicians from the region synthesized different genres and collaborated to create a unique sound. Musicians of different nationalities have developed a mutual understanding something that has been lacking in national and ethnic conflicts between nations in Central Asia. Central Asian jazz during the Soviet time. As part of the 15 Soviet republics, Central Asia reflected all the processes that were going on in the Soviet Union. During the 1960s, Soviet restrictions were gradually relaxed and by the end of the decade, there was an increase in the popularity of jazz in the Soviet republics, which spread through all the major cities and towns. 
Jazz festivals were organized in different Soviet cities. In Tashkent, the first festival was held in 1968. The Tashkent festival had made the first attempt to include national motifs in jazz compositions by mandating that Uzbek songs had to be included in the program. Experiments with references to traditional music took place in the 1960s and 1970s with the appearance of Azerbaijani jazz Mugam, with the contribution of Vadif Mustafa Zadeh and Rafik Babayev, who synthesized jazz with Mugam. The Turkmen group Gunesh, who synthesized jazz, rock, and traditional Turkmen music, and many others. Although fusions between traditional music and jazz had taken place during Soviet times, there have been more opportunities for such artistic collaboration since the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the process has unfolded differently and with new meaning. Jazz festivals in new independent Central Asian countries. While in the first decade after the breakup of the Soviet Union, there were no significant cultural events, the 2000s brought new jazz festivals to the region. The first in Almaty in 2003 inspired me and I initiated and with three like-minded people established the Bishkek Jazz Festival in 2006. This annual event celebrated its 16th year in April 2021. The Bishkek Festival in turn inspired the Dushanbe Festival which appeared in 2009 and the Tashkent Festival which started in 2015. All these festivals were supported by international donors and businesses, as well as by local business organizations. The Bishkek International Jazz Festival, Jazz Bishkek Spring, which I mentioned above, was designed to be a project uniting cultures of different countries and nationalities. We strove to make this festival a traditional annual event that gathers creative people to develop jazz and enrich the cultural environment in Central Asia. Music Without Borders became the festival motto, with the mission to help build bridges between peoples through cultural cooperation in the name of friendship and understanding among nations. Since the start of the Bishkek International Jazz Festival, spontaneous performances by musicians from the US and Europe with Central Asian musicians have continued to be a distinctive feature of our festival. The positive audience responses and the high degree of interest shown by the musicians gave me the idea of starting a project to encourage the development of ethno jazz. We selected the term ethno jazz as we felt that the combination of word ethno and jazz would be able to express our core idea. We did not investigate where the term came from, but thought that for musicians, donors, and audiences, this concept would be understandable. It not just development in Central Asia between 2009 and 2012, public fund Central Asian Arts Management, which I initiated and co-founded in 2008, implemented four ethno-jazz contests. The requirements was for Central Asian musicians to create a composition on a given theme prior to the festival and perform it at the festival. The contest became a major attraction at the jazz festival and received positive feedback from the audiences. In addition to the contest, PFCOM organized round tables and seminars where musicians, scholars, and jazz critics from Central Asia discuss their perspectives on ethno jazz development in Central Asia. Later, PFCOM summarized their discussions and published them in brochures. Ethno jazz in Central Asia, which had started in 2009 as a pilot project, became a strong musical form of expression for Central Asian musicians because of the requirement to prepare an ethno composition in advance of the festival. Musicians 
understanding of ethnogas grew as they worked together over the four-year period. Many had gained valuable experience by the time we started that subsequent Central Asian Ethnogas Laboratory. In March of 2017, 15 musicians from five post-Soviet countries, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, gathered in Tashkent, Uzbekistan for the fifth Ethnogas Laboratory. Over 10 days, they created a 50-minute composition, a joint collaborative work, synthesizing the traditional music of Central Asia, jazz, and contemporary music. They blended European musical instruments with the traditional instruments of Central Asia, as well as different musical traditions such as Palak and Mughan. During this time, musicians worked collaboratively through discussion and musical improvisation to develop the initial ideas for creating a composition that reflected the cultural heritages represented by this group. Musician spectrum. Almost all the laboratory musicians had Western European training, and many of them were graduates of the musical colleges and conservatories which were built during the Soviet time, in addition to the Moscow Conservatory founded in 1866, they were located in Tashkent, Bishkek, Dushanbe, and Baku. Before the conservatory from age seven, most of them studied in a special musical school for gifted children. During four years of the Central Asia's Ethno Jazz Laboratory project, we organized a series of five laboratories. In the next video, I will um, share an excerpt from the first laboratory where the monastery and Kyrgyz epic reciter collaborate with a tragic singer uh, who sings in the style of Fala. Uh, tragic music and um, vocal tradition. of this episode shows that seemingly incompatible things went wrong. Different modes, rhythm, pitch, and intervals intertwined harmoniously representing two different cultures. Rather than being incompatible, Halak and Hamas complemented each other and together better revealed the narrative of the epic. Two performances from different cultures perfectly merged together, penetrating into each other's culture and thereby representing the historical ties of the two peoples and projecting them to the present time. Though mutual understanding, and through mutual understanding, 
between musicians of different nationalities. In conclusion, the Bishkek Festival and its two projects, Ethno Jazz Development in Central Asia and Central Asian Ethno Jazz Laboratory Project, have facilitated the emergence and development of ethno jazz, a new genre that has spread to the region. Because of its improvisatory nature and flexibility, jazz helped to incorporate different traditions, contemporary and folk, and because of its all embracing quality, it brings together musicians with different professional backgrounds in a new environment which helps them to express their national and regional identities to produce a unique Central Asian sound. My research shows the cultural significance of newly emerged Central Asian ethno jazz. It is an important contribution to the new studies of jazz and in understanding the global jazz diaspora. Thank you. Good day, uh, dear colleagues. I am very glad to participate in the work of our panel. My research field is the religious musical culture of Russian Muslims. Currently, we can use this notion in a narrow and a broad sense. In the broad sense, the diverse and rich traditions supported by Muslim diasporas formed the migration flows from the countries of the CIS as well as in a relatively small number from far abroad, for example, from the Middle East, should be taken into account. In the narrow sense of the word, we should talk about the historically established traditions of indigenous Muslims living primarily in the territories of the Ural and Volga region, Tatars and Bashkirs, and in the North Caucasus, Chechens, Ingush, Avaz, Nogais, and other nationalities. At the same time, Muslim ethnic groups were scattered in other regions of the country, the central part of Russia, Siberia, where they formed an original culture, etc. The Tatars were uh, the, Tatars, the largest Russian Muslim community, settled mainly outside of Tatarstan, where only 2 million of the existing 7 million live, while 1.3 million inhabit in Bashkatastan. We focus our attention on the religious musical culture of the Ural Volga uh, uh, Turks, uh, Muslim Tatars, and Bashkis to related peoples that converge in their historical development based on closed languages, territorial contiguity, and ethnic background. Uh, that uh, this study is based on an ethno-regional approach. Today, as it seems to us, there is a need to cover the involution of the religious musical culture of Russian Muslims, as well as CIS Muslims who lived within the borders of the USSR from the standpoint of the concept of globalization. The concept of globalization and colonialism can be considered as antonyms and in a certain sense as synonyms assuming external interests and assimilation of a number of sites from the dominant culture. This study from the standpoint of the category of globalization, the religious musical culture of the Ural Volga, Muslim, Tatars and Bashkis covers. The purpose of this report to outline the stages in the evolution of the religious musical culture of the Ural Volga Turks, accompanied by a change of globalization factors and greater or lesser transformations. To focus special attention on the modifications in the religious musical practice of Muslim Tatars and Baskis in modern Russia, that is the period since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, which led to significant changes in the politics, economy, demography, and culture of the former Soviet republics. Thus, to identify the vectors of globalization and assess their importance for the further development of modern religious music of uh, Russian Muslims. There are 
Uh, separate publications by Russian musicologists devoted to the individual culture of phenomena or the religious musical culture of the Tatars and Bashkirs. However, this scientific problem has not been raised before. What uh, do we mean by the concept of a religious musical culture of uh, Muslim, Tatar and Bashkirs? This fear at the turn of the 20th century, that is before the atheistic Soviet period, we proceed from sources, included first of all genres and forms used in canonical rituals of mosque. Azan, a call to prayer, reading the Quran, uh, in uh, different stylistic manners, dua, invocation at the end of the prayer, taravih, tasbih, dua, melodic praises and praise to the Almighty, and alvida, Ramadan farewell between the parts of the collective additional prayer recited after Isha, obligatory night. Uh, strictly not attached to the mosque, Khatm reading of the entire Quranic on a specific occasion, usually ending with Bagashlaw dedication and dua. Maulid celebration the, of the birthday of Prophet, including melodized Marhaba, praise of uh, the Prophet and Salawat, greeting devoted to the Prophet Muhammad. Munajat, religious chants of the Tatars and Bashkirs. Kuilepuku, reciting of instructive religious texts, usually presented in verse strophic form. Um, for example, the books named Bedavam, repetitive, Mohammadiyya, and the poem Kisayosu by the Bulgarian poet Kulgali. For understanding the specifics of the Ural Volga Muslims' modern religious music culture and the meaning of globalization in its development, in our opinion, we must take a look at the past. In the course of history, these peoples have been repeatedly subjected to the action of multidirectional globalization processes aimed at the formation and the recreation of Islamic musical traditions, the destruction of religious culture due to the conquest and atheism campaign, the renewal, transformation and generation of new religious musical forms. The origin and development of the religious culture of the Eurologo Muslim Tatars and Bashkirs, the ancestors who lived in Volga, Bulgaria, and adjacent territories, was the result of globalization processes inspired by the idea of Islam and continued from the end of the 9th century to the middle of the 16th century. During the first three centuries, the Arab world exerted a noticeable influence on the Muslim Turks of the region. But since the 13th century, second, third, the Turks Mongols invaded their lives. These lands were conquered by the Golden Horde. We split into the Kazan, Nogay, and other Khanates, where the Islamization has continued. Regarding this stage, there is every reason to assume that the mandatory for the entire Islamic world, world following the Arabic style, recitation of the Quran, reestablishing some of the essential principles of Muslim musical thinking in general, coexisted with a commitment to another style, um, based like all Tatar and Bashkir musical culture on a pentatonic scale and intoning. The subsequent globalization process had been hitting the Tatars and Bashkirs from the middle of the 16th century. Led to a radical transformation, meaning Christianization and crucifixion. It resulted from the conquest of the Kazan Khanate and the Annexation of neighboring lands to Russia by Tsar Ava the Terrible, which in turn led to a noticeable destruction of Islamic culture and hampered its development. The forced migration of the Turks to rural settlements promoted the, the folklorization of religious musical forms. 
However, the rigid tough policy was replaced by progressive reforms and liberalization in relation with the Muslims under the reign of Catherine Gray in the late 18th century, supported in the Russian Empire until the beginning of the 20th century. Russian Muslims restored the religious education system and ties with the Muslim Middle East which ensured the flourishing of religious musical culture, cultivating either Arabic and Turkic Tatar Bashkir melodic styles as evidenced by historical sources. See the historical books of the ninth and the first third of the 20th century by the Tatar and Bashkir theologians, Imams Shehabuddin Marjani, and uh, Reza Adin Fakhredin. At the same time, at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, Russian Muslims, formerly Arab countries, the Ottoman Empire, were faced with the threats of globalization associated with the Europeanization. It was initiated by the Muslim elite of the Ural Volga region, supporting Jadidism, the renewal movement. The secular spirit, the Russian and the European languages penetrated the religious education. An interest in the Western literature and art was aroused, and European traditions were included, included in everyday Muslim life. Uh, Islamic musical forms were heard in concerts and recorded on the first Edison rollers and discs. During uh, the Soviet era, the progressive development of the religious culture of Muslims, as well as followers of other faiths, uh, was severely interrupted. The globalization processes caused by the atheist curse and the policy of Russification generated by the Soviet ideology led to the destruction of the religious sphere and the leveling of ethnic confessional features in culture. The new age from a structuring since the end of the 1990s put the Muslims before the need for the revival of the religious musical forms existed among Tatars and Bashkis in the past, including the Quranic reciting practice. Here, first of all, the task is to study Atajwid the science of pronouncing an Arabic text according to special rules. At the same time, we need for the ability to read the Quran in the Arabic style, which is canonical for the entire Islamic world is realized. It is fulfilled by studying abroad in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, etc., by missionary and teaching activities in Russia carried out by natives of those countries, Arabs, Turks, and Muslims from the CIS countries, the spreading of audio and video recordings and access to internet resources. It is only later that young Muslims set the task of restoring the ethno-regional diatonic pentatonic scale tradition of reciting of the Quran. Summing up, we can say that most of the religious musical traditions components are revived, but not all of them. Some of the forms must have fallen into oblivion. For example, chanting religion, religious and didactic texts, etc. Besides, some canonical practices and religious genres have transformed. Firstly, Khatam is the practice of reading the entire text of the Quran has turned into the round the clock reading of the sacred text with an online broadcast. This happens. Uh, in the cathedral mosque in Moscow, the mosque Kul Sharif in Kazan, in Tatarstan. Secondly, the traditional monarchs 
reviving by some enthusiasts. He has transformed into a pop song with the religious content and into such ultra-modern forms as Muslim rap based on Russian, Tatar, and Bashkir languages, and Hanuk its own variety, Alayla rap, with almost speech and intonations and without musical accompaniment. Thirdly, the religious culture is being restored both as in villages and as in mega cities, acquiring the entertainment and diversity characteristics of modern mass art. So, for example, in Moscow, as uh, the spiritual administration of Muslims of, Ra of the Russian Federation, and as diaspora, for example, Kyrgyz one, transforms Maulids celebrations in honor of the prophet into grandiose thematic events. It includes ethnically diverse religious chants, including Arabic nashis, making you think about the ethnic festivals. The, mm, this. The music and theatrical performances are introduced in the most international competitions, competitions of reading the Quran organized since 2000. Historically, the Ural Volga Turks musical culture, as well as Russian Muslims in general, are repeatedly, repeatedly involved in the globalization processes that change its stylistic characteristics. At the present stage, the religious musical traditions of Russian Muslims are focused on both the traditions of the West and the Islamic East, following the two-vector globalization. In a certain sense, a similar situation developed more than a century ago due uh, to other historical factors. Today, if the practice of the Quranic reading as well as on the call to prayer in Arabic style and adaptation of the Arab nashids indicate the, the influence of the Islamic East, then the creation of Muslim rabbi Tatas and Bashir reveals the apparent effect of westernization. In conclusion, I offer to your attention the musical examples illustrating the modern situation. The first recording is a Quranic reciting by Hazrat Ashad Gimadinov. He is the first among the Ural Volga Turks to comprehend the science of Karat and the art of reading on Makam. Hazrat Ashad learned the Makamat art under sheikhs from Saudi Arabia and Morocco. He uses rust, vayati, and hawant, hijaz, and jam makams, choosing a mode depending on the Quranic content. The sheikh recites verses of the Quranic surah uh, Yusuf using Arabic makam and jam. قال بل سولت لكم أنفسكم أمرا فصبر جميل عسى الله أن يأتيني بهم جميعا إنه هو العليم الحكيم وتولى عنهم وقال يا أسف على يوسف وقال يا أسف على يوسف the next recording is the reading of the Quranic Surah al duha The Morning, by Haz uh, Zahid Hazrat Kazakhanov, having studied uh, at Tajweed, consciously cultivated the pentatonic style of reading. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى.
The next uh, recording uh, is a traditional Tarawih, historically, melodically intoning by Abu Stai Gufarida Abu Bakirova. She collected about uh, 100 old tunes, prepared CDs with recording, etc. Subhan azil mulki wal malakut Subhan azil ghizati wal ghazamati wal qudrati wal qibriyai wal jabarut Subhan al maliki khayr ladhi la yamut Subhan quddus rabbil malaykati wal ruh La ilaha illa Allah, nastaghfirullah. Nas'aluka al-jannata wa na'udhu bika min al-nar. The last sample is a rap closer to the star by Timur Bilal from Bashkatastan Republic. The rap is composed by young imam in a Russian language, including philosophical reflections, summing up to the conclusion about the existence of good. Не скажут, покажут ответ Для чего мы родились на свет Почему он такой, а я нет Кто создатель этих планет Каждый день мы встречаем рассвет О Всевышний, ты есть или нет Подключаю свой мозг инструмент Начинаю искать и ответ Может ли создатель наш Видеть абсолютно все Может ли создатель наш Слышать абсолютно все Он создал тебя, меня Абсолютно все и все Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. We finished our video. Now it's the time for questions. Please, anyone with the questions, let us know what would you like uh, to ask and who is uh, your question addressed for, okay? Any questions? Uh, there are some experts on the similar subjects um, among uh, within our uh, audience. For example, Zakia Sapienova, would you like to ask a question about uh, perhaps composer music in uh, Kazakhstan? Do you have any uh, comments or questions, please? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much, Yarazia. I'm glad to see you. Uh, yes, uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Lera Nedlina for her um, prominent report. It was very interesting and it was uh, highly systematized and classified and periodized uh, as well. So I think that the um, summarized uh, report was very well, well um, presented. Uh, I actually have no the questions, but the offer uh, is that um, pro possible to write it down or publi um, publicate it, because I think that the, uh, it's quite um, um, summarizing of such a 30 great years of our independence. So it would be very nice. <laughs> Very nice to um, underline the results of the independent musicological life in Kazakhstan as well. So I actually have no questions, but would like to thank all the presenters. It was very interesting. And I think the um, theme is very interesting because the uh, transmission is very um, important time to sing, to re-sing and everything. And thank you very much, Razia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zakiya. Uh, I can see some comments from Professor Yasmina Talam. Yasmina, would you like to comment on our panel or perhaps you have some questions to ask? Please join us. Thank you, Razia. I don't have any comments. It was very, very interesting and there are many news information that I collected today. 
thank you once more for all of you who presented your papers today. Thank you very much for your kind word. We have also a rising scholar called uh, Rose Virkoe from London. Would you like to ask us any questions, please, Rose? Okay, if you don't have any uh, more questions later. Uh, ah, yes, please. Sorry, I was raising my hand, but uh, it was <laughs> invisible for any chance. Hi, I'm Shihogura. I'm uh, a master's student at National University of Singapore. And I'm not really expert of any Central Asian or Asian Asian music. And it was really first time for me to, um, you know, see the works, the past scholarship and the works that you're working on. It was very really impressive. And I'm also interested in those transnationality of the music, decolonization or de westernization of the music, et cetera. So it was very really interesting, even not for non yellow Russian or like Central Asian music scholars, scholar. And I have two questions to um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Razia and Dr. Uh, Valeria. I hope I pronounced your name correctly though. Um, so the first question to um, Dr. Razia is the one that you mentioned about the smartphone. Yeah, the, like the changing the uh, soundscape of the current Moscow and Russia through the smartphone. I thought the idea was very interesting. And then I have the question that I wonder if that is a smartphone, the like, you know, the technical device or the platform such as social net, like, you know, uh, SNS or like TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or that kind of a, a social platform that allow the young adults to kind of like, um, you know, proactively engage with the like in the global community or like you know to claim the um kind of international solidarity um across the border i mean across the nation state of like you know, russia and um uh, i get that was the kazakhstan I, I forgot i'm sorry i forgot like in you know, the Tatan, um the homeland and that was the one and also like i, I really um, couldn't really get the, uh, the uh, Samsung Galaxy 7. I really, because I, I, I cannot read any Russian. So like, I really don't know like what the Samsung Galaxy 7 on that, on that video of the goal means. Like I, so like there is a title before that Samsung Galaxy 7, but I couldn't really read it. So I wonder like, you know what it means? Like, is it kind of commercialized or is it kind of like and the commercialized in the Samsung Galaxy 7 or like the CJ said that like, oh yeah, I taped this like with the Samsung Galaxy 7 or not. So this is the two questions to um, Dr. Razia. And the other question to Dr. Vale Va Valeria is that um, I, I'm also like interested in, um, the, the, uh, in, well, in a way in uh, the westernized kind of analytical approach to the uh, music, uh, which I thought like your position covers so of that. And I wonder, I'm sorry if I miss anything, but I wonder if there is any sort of the kind of music theory that uh, specifically established to analyze the concept of music, because I saw that like uh, there is a Russian or like, or let's say Western kind of notation, I mean, note and like, and then like I saw that like there is a little of the you note know, and all that, but I wonder if there is any um, kind of musical theory, kind of like, um, I don't know, analytical approach that I established, like especially tailored for the Kazakh music. And that is the question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. They were lovely, your questions. Well done. So very good question about smartphone culture, right? Certainly, the whole, uh, you know, uh, amount of various forms of social network, whether it's Facebook or uh, TikTok or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, it all now helps, you know, for those new names to appear within the communities of um, uh, migrants um, uh, my, uh, and to uh, present the new, uh, let's say, images, new genres, new songs, if only they have a, a willingness to compose something about their feelings and their current, you know, situation in their private life, whatever. They can put it and, uh, you know, air it, you know, share it with their uh, colleagues and friends and so on and family, whatever. 
it's very the reason we are talking about it today because it's very different to what it used to be during the Soviet Union. Well, e when every single performance was, uh, uh, you know, by the selection committee uh, uh, was kind of um, controlled and protected. I mean, uh, without this control, whether it's allowed for the white public or not, the song or the uh, you know, piece, instrumental piece would never appear in public. So now there is no control. It's all, you know, uh, free now. And the, certainly the social network technology helps a lot for these uh, migrants, you know, new names of migrants uh, who come to live in Russia in search of uh, uh, jobs, you know, uh, to become, uh, let's say, performers, music performers. So it's a really new trend. And uh, thank you for your questions to point it out. It helped me to point it out. Thank you very much. Lera, it's you now. Uh, yeah, Tom. yeah, I, I, I'm turning on the mic. Uh, th thank you, dear uh, Shiho, uh, uh, for your interesting question. I, I think it can be taken broader uh, and we can uh, take a look on it from the um, question of professionalism, oral or written one. Uh, of course, uh, Kazakh traditional music, since the uh, Kazakhs are nomadic um, society, uh, it uh, developed for uh, thousands of years as oral tradition, and uh, it has no own system of notation and any formalized theory. But of course, um, this uh, transmission process requires a special terminology for uh, not only for instruments for and for parts of instruments but also uh, for um, uh, parts in the form of music composition and uh, for uh, for example some special moments in uh, music composition um, probably there also uh, was some uh, ideas about modes uh, but uh, nowadays we, we um, uh, have uh, the autochthonous uh, music theory only for uh, Dombra Kui. Dombra is a lute chordophone and Kui is an instrumental piece played on Dombra. Uh, and, uh, this uh, special music theory is very developed uh, and um, studying it helped to uh, recognize uh, the uh, m many traditions as uh, in the status of professional one. Uh, before, in Soviet times, they were studied as uh, folklore, uh, like, you know, something that is lower than uh, music of composers or Western composers. And uh, Westernized analytical approach uh, initially took into account only the ideas of Western theory and uh, scholars tried to apply such uh, notions as, as for example period or mode interval uh, to kazakh uh, traditional music since they knew nothing about oral uh, tra uh, traditional terms uh, and it helped a lot in this um, you know, ap applying Kazakh music as a uh, 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 professional tradition as well. Because when you find in such a simple thing as two voiced kui, such uh, complicated compositional uh, techniques as uh, canonic imitation, as um, uh, interchanges in, in between the voices, uh, it uh, changes the attitude to the sim uh, visual simplicity of this tradition. Uh, so now we have special music theory uh, that was developed by uh, scholars trained in Western system, but uh, very well familiar uh, with oral uh, tradition. And uh, one of the most promising areas of this uh, autochthonous theory is a theory of temperation which is now uh, just beginning to develop that's it thank you very much uh, yes do we have more questions 
In that case, I have a question to Lera. Razia, uh, I'm sorry, there is a question in chat box. Because uh, I can't see any questions. From Sui Beng Tang. Yeah, 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 it's my question. Here, yeah, please. Sui Beng, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I was very excited by the new popular music, the pop and the rap, uh, and the and the content of the songs. Um, I I would like to ask whether there are any criticisms from the conservative Muslims about using pop and rap, and also about women singing in public. Um, so. You know, because in in this region, um, for the conservative Muslims, uh, women are not allowed to go on stage. You're not supposed to sit together with men, and there are all these rules. You know, uh, whenever there's a performance, and uh, if if you break these rules, they can just cancel uh, the performance. So, is it the same in uh, uh, in where you are? Is it the question to Zila? Who you are addressing your question? Su Bank. Who is your question for? Oh, uh, uh, either you or Zila. Yeah. Zila, please. It's better for Zila. Yes, please, Zila. Can you hear us, Zila? Микрофон. Uh, uh, I want to ask uh, that uh, um, now in uh, modern culture, um, uh, the uh, programs of uh, different grandiose events included uh, uh, um, uh, as both. Uh, um, men as singers and uh, uh, women as singers. And uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, a new tradition, a new tradition. Uh, now uh, there are uh, some uh, uh, religious uh, um, uh, men's uh, uh, some imams who uh, uh, does not agree with this situation, but uh, uh, I think uh, this situation was in uh, the past and uh, will be in a future because uh, the Islamic Ummah uh, consists uh, uh, from uh, uh, different uh, um, Muslims with contrary opinions uh, about uh, many uh, different uh, problems. Uh, I, uh, я приветствую всячески участие женщин мусульманок в разных мероприятиях. I agree with this practice. Uh, when uh, young uh, women, uh, young women uh, sing uh, for um, public. To perform in public. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Subeng. So I have a question to Lera. Uh, was the picture which you drawn about the study of music in Kazakhstan typical just for Kazakhstan or in general to all five republics of Central Asia? I think, we, we, yeah, it's a really good question. I think we, we, we passed very similar ways. Uh, uh, it, it, it's only the question about the terms. Probably Uzbek uh, musicology went through the same problems even earlier. Uh, and life Uspensky, you know, Turkmen music and so on. So just uh, there are there are very similarity. Yes, and, and they influenced uh, the ideas of uh, Kazakhstani musicologists a lot. And you know, Arme Armenian, Azerbaijan musicology, uh, no, uh, Nona Grigorievna Shahnazarova, who uh, had a very um, uh, progressive ideas. Uh, 
uh, which was hard to express, I, I think, uh, during the Soviet Sorry. times. Yes, and it probably it was one of the factors that influenced the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, you know. It could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Razia, may, may I uh, uh, return the question? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, well. Uh, I, I noticed that the, the uh, projects you were talking about all was polylingual, uh, at least bilingual. And uh, this um, linguistic situation is, uh, becomes uh, very, you know, um, very uh, sharp edge, edge of the political uh, discussions today. Uh, both in Russia and in uh, Kazakhstan, probably you know this um, uh, linguistic situation in Uzbekistan. Uh, is Russian applied by uh, modern Uzbeks and uh, is it presented on stage in music making and so on? Thank you, it's a good question because really after the fall of the USSR, with the search for the national identity. Uh, many republics, they concentrated just on their own languages. And in Uzbekistan, like in, in Kar uh, Kazakhstan as well, there were these, uh, if you remember, Turkish colleges where the main uh, accent was done on the local languages and English languages. So Russian was just, you know, kicked off. Unfortunately, it still uh, has a place without Turkish colleges, but in Uzbek schools already in Uzbekistan. And it's a real problem. Thank you for your question, because it's a real problem for the migrant communities. Central Asian migrant communities coming to work in Russia, they hardly ever speak any Russian language. And sometimes the, there are so many anecdotal, anecdotal you know, uh, situations when they are they try to express themselves, but they don't speak any, any kind of proper language, even for the table conversations, you know, and if there is a police, you know, kind of facing a policeman and so on, they can't, they don't know how to respond and so on. And now as a result, the um, uh, society, not society, but foundation for uh, migrant communities, uh, uh, which is um, uh, working all over in Russia, they uh, established this kind of exam in Russian language and without passing this exam, uh, without, you know, this kind of um, uh, license that you speak uh, Russian, uh, migrants, they can't find a job. Indeed, the young generation now speaks better English or even German, but not Russian. The same uh, is going, the situation is going on in Caucasus and so on. Yes, and, but your question is very good because uh, have you noticed or not? Pop music is fully populated Russian <laughs> Russian language. Even Ukrainian group, uh, one of very interesting duo called uh, Pyatnitsa, they produced a very interesting uh, a number of songs. And one of them, it's kind of Nietu Doma, Nietu Flaga Mama, which is uh, no home, no flag, mom, and so on which means it's a cry for the lost, you know, country, for the lost uh, home, you know, attitude to the former empire, at least the whole, you know, childhood spending in the empire and then, you know, come out in the small republic. It's a different, uh, very different feeling, very different situations. And pop music in many countries, in the same Ukraine is Verka Serdyuchka, uh, who sings uh, and performs in Russian, the same in Latvia and Pre-Baltic states, uh, Baltic states, and so on. Which means pop music is still very much populated, uh, very much present, you know, uh, um, performed in Russian language. So it's a very good question because it covers many different, you know, angles of the situation. Thank you, Lara. Do we have more questions? Thank you, Razia. Carlos writes he loves Pyatnitsa. <laughs> Pyatnitsa is excellent. Yes, it's exactly. Uh, I have a question to uh, Kaneke. Where is Kaneke? Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation on festival uh, industry, right, in Central Asia. But tell us, please, uh, what is the impact of the pandemic situation on those uh, festivals, you know, 
ethno jazz festivals are they still existing or the everything has stopped yeah thank you very much uh my colleagues in bishkek they still organized um, during 2020 there was uh, an online festival and i think the online format was everywhere worldwide uh, for many uh, concerts and festivals and i think that was a kind of new format and uh, at the same time new challenge for all artists uh, musicians to present their work online. Uh, but I think it was a very good opportunity. So because of that format to do the online festival, we could continue um, without any breaks. That's, uh, and then uh, last year was already on the stage. So it just continues. So uh, that was good to have uh, an experience to do the online uh, festival. Thank you. What about the plans for future festivals? Any plans for this year, next year? What's the situation? Tell us. Please. Yeah, I can I can talk on behalf of the uh, Bishkek Jazz Festival because I'm still uh, a member of the organizing committee. Mm, uh, yeah, my colleagues are planning and they also organized the fall festival. Uh, another opportunity to present Kyrgyz and international uh, musicians. And uh, uh, as usual, it's an, an annual uh, event in April. So they're going to organize the next festival in April, 2022. Thank you very much. If we don't have more questions, any more comments or questions, I think we should thank everyone who joined us on Saturday afternoon, you know, or uh, morning or evening in other parts of the world. And I would like once again to uh, thank Su Beng Tan and Carlos Yodor in uh, helping to initiate such a huge, uh, very interesting, very stimulating project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.